Okay, so we are looking at learning targets of understanding fiscal and monetary policy. All right, so when we look at the roots of economic policy, we're looking at the 19th century laissez-faire um, industrialization with the increasing accidents and disease. We start with the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887, which was intended to rein in the railroads, and the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, which was to prohibit the restraints of trade. When we look at the progressive era, they drew support from the middle class and they sought to reform political, economic, and social systems. So you had the Pure Drug and Food and Drug Act, Meat Inspection Act, think of the jungle. Uh, we had the beginning of consumer protections. You had the Federal Reserve Act in, the in 1913 and the 16th Amendment for the collection of federal income taxes came about at the same time. So the Great Depression and the New Deal brought about a whole lot of financial reforms. So there was the Glass-Steagall Act, um, which was in part a lot of tariffs, and that actually helped to lead to the Great Depression. We had the FDIC as a result of the New Deal. Agriculture, we had farm subsidies. Within labor, there was the right to unionize, and the industry developed a lot of regulations for communications, civil, civil aviation, trucking, all of those things. Uh, and then we move forward into President Ford and a little further on into Reagan with this deregulation. So we are going to uh, move away from a lot of that federal control of things. So deregulation was a major part of Ford's administration. You had the Airline Deregulation Act of seven, excuse me, of 1978, which eliminated the economic regulation of the airlines. It actually ultimately resulted in less competition. Within agriculture, Congress reduced and then replaced subsidies because, again, the farm um, farmers are well represented in Congress. When we look at the financial sector, uh, there was deregulation in the financial sector in the 1990s, and that actually helped lead us into the subprime mortgage crisis in 2007. Right. So how do agriculture subsidies regulate the economy? All right, well, again political cartoons. So as we look at this, and we're going to move into fiscal policy now, we're really looking at how it started responding to recessions, the debt ceiling, and then the global context of this entire thing. So the foundations were Keynes. Okay, so you got Keynesian economics, and he was a British economist, and he argued that the government could avoid recessions if we stimulated demand and even if we caused deficits, as long as we were stimulating demand, that we would be able to, to work ourselves out of, of recessions and, and eventually avoid them. So when we're looking at fiscal policy here in the United States with the Revenue Act of 1964, it reduced personal and corporate income taxes, it expanded the economy, and it led to 4% unemployment. Uh, there was this idea that budget deficits in the long term can lead to inflation. So when we look at where our money comes from, the federal money uses to pay our bills, mostly it's going to come from taxes. You've got a, a major portion here that is coming from our individual income taxes. You've got payroll taxes. You've got corporate taxes. We have excise taxes and then other taxes. So when we're looking at our individual taxes, um, our social insurance payroll taxes, this is going to be the fastest growing piece. Uh, this is Social Security, Medicare, unemployment insurance, federal employee retirement payments. All of that goes into that piece. You've got corporate income taxes. Those have shrunk steadily as the percentage of GDP. All right. Um, and then now we're going to look at where the money goes. Okay, so we know we have discretionary spending, uh, and we know we have mandatory spending. So how can we respond to recession? Well, in 2008, we had the economic slowdown. So we had $168 billion of a stimulus package and $700 billion to bail out um, banks and the like. So... 
that's pieces of it. We also had the Trouble Assets Relief Program, so that's trying to get people out of foreclosures, and the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. So that's all pieces of trying to get out of the slowdown um, of 2008 and trying to create demand. So when we're looking at the stimulus package, these included tax rebates that the government hoped that the middle class would use to spend money and would boost the economy. The thing when I'm teaching economics that I always try to get people to remember is that what is best for you, the consumer or your family, is usually the opposite of what is good for the economy as a whole and vice versa. So for me and my family, the best thing that would be I, I can do with my money is either to invest my money into my my account, my you know, my my portfolio or to invest it in putting it into my savings account. Like that's the best thing for my family. That doesn't work for the economy because with a stimulus package, the idea is that I'm going to take that money and buy something. Because if I go out and buy something and you go out and buy something and the, the person next to you goes out and buys something, you're going to put more money into the economy and hopefully stimulate it enough. That's why it's called a stimulus package so that people are going to go out, buy stuff, which will then create more jobs and, and will get the economy running again. The problem for the government and the economy as a whole was that most people either put the money into the bank or they paid off a credit card or you know made a payment towards a credit card or made a house payment or something like that. That does not stimulate the economy. And so the stimulus package, while it, it was nice for the individual families, it really didn't do anything much at all for the actual economy. So we had $70 billion that went into bailing out the banks and financial institutions trying to fix the subprime mortgage crisis. Um, and it authorized the Secretary of the Treasury to supply cash directly to the banks. So that was one piece. So the mortgages, um, basically the banks didn't end up shutting down. This is that idea of too big to fail. So we had the Troubled Assets Relief Program, which was trying to buy up assets that had led to the crisis. Um, so a lot of banks in this had uh, a lot of houses that had been foreclosed upon. And if you have a lot of properties that are foreclosed on, then the prices of the houses around and the other areas nearby also are going to, to go down because why would anyone pay full price for your house when two doors down, there's a house that's for sale in foreclosure and is a quarter of the cost. So then we had the American Recovery Re Reinvestment Act and that was a $787 billion bill authorizing spending on tax cuts and public works programs. Again, this is trying to, to stimulate the economy by making jobs. Um, however, a lot of those gains were actually negated by the cuts in government spending at the state and local level. So there was more coming in from the federal level, but the states had to cut their budgets as well, as so does local governments. And so it really was just kind of a wash in many cases. So this gives you an idea on the tax, oops, sorry, the tax cuts, the funds, where everything went. All right. Um, and again, it, it was very difficult to get out of that. When we look at the debt ceiling, all right, so we had money and then during um, the Bush administration tax cut, we had wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and then we had bailout bills. So our debt had reached $14.2 trillion by 2011. Now we have what's called a debt ceiling, which is kind of for lack of a better way to explain it, it's kind of like a credit card limit. And just like with a credit card, if you want to spend above your limit, you've got to call the credit card company and ask, and they can either decide to increase your limit or not. So that's kind of the way that this works with the debt ceiling. We have an amount of money that is the amount, that the top amount that we can spend. Uh, and then Congress can vote to spend above it if they want to. So in 2011, we had what was called the Budget Control Act, in which it authorized a series of automatic debt ceiling increases. And that, because of the way that the budget was set up in the, the act, it also had automatic spending cuts that came in in 2013. 
Um, that's also why we had um, these ideas of the government shutdowns and things as well, because um, we have to vote each time about whether we're going to raise that spending limit. And sometimes it turns into, well, it always turns into a political issue, but it, it becomes um, so much so that are we going to pass it? Are we not? Do we need to make a budget that's going to fit under the debt ceiling? Um, and it turns into a major issue into which either the government does shut down or there is the threat of the government shutting down. Um, sadly, it's, it's actually not an uncommon thing any longer. So when we look at who owns the debt, this is the money and who owns it. So you've got U.S. individuals and institutions. We owe money to the Social Security Trust Fund, um, the Federal Reserve, military retirement, foreign nations. Um, this one is all other, all right? Um, and then this one is China and Hong Kong. Japan is here. Uh, we also have Belgium here. Uh, the oil exporters here, Brazil, and then the UK. And again, this is all the other foreign nations. So when we look at fiscal policy in a global contents, context, globalization has benefits. Uh, we've got a greater movement of goods and services. You can move capital across borders. There's more variety for consumers. It's lower cost for consumers. So, um, you also have an increased standard of living in a lot of developing countries. So those are the positives of globalization. However, there are some problems with globalization as well. So you've got greater risk, financial collapse uh, in one country can spread very quickly um, to others. Um, we saw this in Greece and Spain in 2012. Um, within the Eurozone, there's been major economic problems. Uh, the other issue, too, is that while the standard of living in developing countries has increased, it it's definitely not that they have increased to, uh, like, U.S. standards of living. It's just that they have increased from pennies a day to quarters a day. So then when we're looking at monetary policy and the Federal Reserve System and the tools of monetary policy, uh, you've got the Federal Reserve System. Uh, which has 12 Red Federal Reserve banks and other member banks, and they have a dual mandate, and that's to control inflation and to limit unemployment. And that's, again, this gives you an idea of what that looks like, and these are your districts. Again, they're much like our uh, judges, okay? So we have open market operations in which there is the buying and selling of government securities or debt. There's the discount rate, and that's the rate of interest in which it lends money to member banks. You've got reserve requirements, and that says how much of the deposits that the banks have to keep on hand. This keeps from having banks collapse if people need to go in and get money out of the bank. We have social security policy. So the if you remember the CWA and the WPA and social security uh, and, and all of those are are pieces of this as well. All right. And if you remember when you do this, it is a non means tested because, again, you've qualified. All right. And this is how much we benefit. Uh, and again, when we look at recession and recovery, we use fiscal policy, we use monetary policy, we use income security policy, uh, and then we have to evaluate. And again, if we are looking at stimulus, poli excuse me, stimulus packages, we're looking at fiscal policy.